welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti, and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews, we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime, and today I'm really looking forward to having a discussion with you about the Genovese mobster who served in nearly every role within the family, and that's Tony Salerno. Salerno typified the 20th century mobster, and is probably why so many fictional characters share his nickname, Fat Tony. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please head on over to that Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss, so let's get right to it. Anthony Salerno was born in East Harlem, New York, on August 15, 1911. This location was within the territory of the 116th Street Crew, also known as the Uptown Crew. This was a powerful arm of the now Genovese family that Salerno would come to rule. He was raised in this area and quickly made his way into the life of a mobster. At the time of Salerno's birth, Nicholas Terranova, the half-brother of Genovese family founder Giuseppe Morello, was boss. By the time Salerno was old enough to join the Mafia, the Castellamarese War was already in full swing. It's likely that he got started at the end of the war, with Joe Miseria serving as boss. Miseria as Salerno's boss would be short-lived, as Luciano would double-cross him, and everyone would briefly be under Salvatore Maranzano's leadership. That lasted an even shorter amount of time after Luciano turned around and double-double-crossed Maranzano, becoming boss himself. Ultimately, Salerno's experience with stable family headship began with Lucky Luciano. By the time Salerno was a teenager, he was working beneath capo Michael Trigger Mike Coppola in gambling, loan sharking, and protection rackets. He would become one of the most valuable members of this crew, said to be over millions of dollars worth of racketeering and loan sharking operations. Since Salerno was made into the family, it's fair to assume that he had committed many murders in his day, although he was never charged. Salerno's boss Coppola, however, did not share that same fortune. By 1948, Coppola had moved to Florida to avoid a murder charge, leaving open the position of capo in a family now under the leadership of Frank Costello. Salerno was an obvious choice for the job and was chosen to fill the role at the age of 37. As capo, his power grew tremendously and he was very good at his job. Salerno was a natural at being a mobster. He, unlike many of his counterparts, never seemed to be tempted into getting involved with the drug business and instead stayed in his lane of gambling, loan sharking, union corruption, and racketeering. It was widely believed, but never proven, that Salerno was involved with financially backing a heavyweight professional boxing fight in secret. This fight in 1959 at Yankee Stadium was between Swedish Ingemar Johansson and American Floyd Patterson. The odds were four to one in Patterson's favor, but Johansson pulled out a win when he knocked out Patterson and claimed the heavyweight champ title. This fight generated millions of dollars and at the time was the most profitable boxing match in history. There were plenty of whispers about Salerno's involvement at the time, but nothing ever came from it. More than in New York, Salerno was known to be a major player in the financial backing of several nationwide gambling operations, including but not limited to Florida, Los Angeles, Boston, and Las Vegas. In fact, Salerno's wife, Margaret May Salerno, 19 years his junior, had been a Las Vegas showgirl and dancer for several years. Once the two were wed, they went on to have three children together, two daughters and one son. By the 1960s, the Genovese family was now firmly controlled by the family's namesake Don, Vito Genovese, and Salerno was running the largest numbers racket in New York, bringing in an estimated $50 million a year. This capo split his time between New York and Florida. In New York, he had a lavish apartment in Manhattan, as well as an expansive horse farm in Rhinebeck, which was also his primary residence. His property in Miami Beach, besides being a wonderful place to relax, was a great place for him to stay when he wanted to keep a close eye on his gambling operations in Florida. He was spotted in Miami multiple times in September and October of 1965 in connection with illicit sports gambling operations. He was also seen meeting with known local Miami gangsters on February 11th, 1965, but nothing came from this investigation. Through the 1960s, as Harlem became home to mostly Black and Puerto Rican Americans, most Italian Americans in the area moved away, but Salerno remained. He kept his headquarters at the Palma Boys Social Club, where many mafiosi would come to give Salerno his payments and or ask for his guidance. This had been the previous headquarters of Coppola, Salerno's old boss. Salerno was clearly not somebody enthusiastic about change, but why would he be? Everything seemed to be going his way. It is said that from the collections he made at Palma Boys, Salerno had shoeboxes full of cash stacked in the closet of his apartment, more than a million dollars. When he wasn't rolling in dough made from his various operations, he worked as a mediator between several mafias and mafiosi around the country. He settled disputes and kept the operations running smoothly. Salerno was an excellent mobster as he kept a low profile, settled disputes, and didn't have the type of ambition that many of his abilities seemed to exhibit. He was content to be capo, obey his boss, and make tons of money. 
He also enjoyed taking long weekends from New York, leaving on Thursdays from his post at Palma Boys. A charmed life and schedule for this gambling kingpin. Much of his leisurely lifestyle came to him thanks to the assistance of his protege and right-hand man, Vincent the Fish Cafaro, whom Salerno trusted implicitly. This trust would later be revealed as misplaced, but we'll get to that toward the end of this video. Additionally, his attitude made it very difficult to pin Salerno down on any particular charge, as he was always flying under the radar. Eventually, however, the FBI would credibly accuse him of controlling a bookie and loan shark network that brought in about a million dollars a year. Salerno's first criminal conviction did not occur until 1978, when he was 67 years old. Despite multiple arrests and crimes of which he was suspected, Salerno maintained a squeaky clean record until this point. Salerno employed famous mob lawyer Roy Cohn to represent him on the charges. On April 19, 1978, Salerno would plead guilty to gambling and tax charges. The prosecution charged Salerno with accepting at least $10 million a year from illegal policy wages, but only listing an income of $40,000 per year on his income taxes. Given his luxurious lifestyle and multiple properties, that number seemed unlikely. Cohn would explain this away by describing his client as, quote, a sports gambler. Ultimately, this would result in a $25,000 fine. The maximum sentence available for the charges would have been two years, but the judge, taking into account Salerno's age and health issues, was merciful in only making it a six-month prison sentencing. The judge did, however, reject the plea for probation. After the sentencing was ruled, Salerno said to the judge, Thank you very much, Your Honor. Later, his attorney Cohn said that the judge was, quote, extremely fair. After Salerno was released from prison, he would be promoted to the high rank of underboss beneath the new family boss, Philip Lombardo, who had been Genovese's former acting boss until his death in 1969. You know that a mobster walked away with a slap on the wrist when he personally thanks the judge, his defense lawyer describes it as fair, and he goes back to his mafia family and earns a promotion. It was true, though, that Salerno had several health problems. He was overweight, in fact his nickname was Fat Tony, not to be confused with the Simpsons character. As a result, Salerno suffered from diabetes and early on in 1981, he had a mild stroke. It's reported that Fat Tony, shockingly, did not like this nickname and was personally offended when one of the young upstarts called him that to his face. Salerno said, quote, If it wasn't for me, there wouldn't be no mob left. I made all the guys. Salerno, unlike even some of the more traditional old school gangsters, did not seem to be very concerned about his appearance. Overweight and consistently chewing on a cigar, Salerno was known to attend mafia meetings wearing t-shirts and a fedora. He dressed more like a pretentious college student than a mafia bigwig. 1981 was a big year for Salerno in terms other than health concerns. This was also the year that he was mistakenly listed as the Genovese family boss following the retirement of Lombardo, who had been boss for 12 years, although you might not have known that, since he utilized front bosses the entire time he was the leader to insulate himself from law enforcement. After Genovese's death, it was more difficult for law enforcement to keep track of who was boss of that family. While Lombardo had truly passed the baton to Vincent the Chin Gigante, Salerno had been serving as his front boss and consigliere during a portion of his tenure. Once Lombardo retired, it was assumed that Salerno was made boss. The truth was that Salerno continued his role as front boss for Gigante. By February of 1985, Tony Salerno, along with the bosses of the other four New York Mafia families, was indicted on a federal racketeering charge now known as the Mafia Commission trial. While Salerno was not the real boss of the family, he was listed as such in all of the court documents and reporting. This mistake is usually considered a fair one since Salerno was such a convincing front boss. However, many argued, even at the time, that his position was being exaggerated in order to draw public attention to the other trial he had going on at the same time, which we will break down momentarily. He and his legal team had requested bail, which was denied. Infuriated by the denial, his legal team sought the judgment of a higher court. This case made it all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. To Salerno and his team's aggravation, the Supreme Court maintained the rulings of the lower courts for him to be held without bail because he was a potential danger to the community. This case was decided in the United States versus Salerno, if you'd like to read more about that. While the Mafia Commission trial was taking place, Salerno was in the throes of a different case. This case accused Salerno of a separate racketeering charge, with Salerno having secret controlling interests in SNA Concrete Company and Transit Mix Concrete Company, which were responsible for the construction of Mount Sinai School of Medicine, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and Trump Tower. Also mixed in with this indictment was the accusation of tampering with union elections, specifically by illegally assisting Roy Lee Williams win the presidency of the Teamsters Union. Salerno would plead not guilty, but would be found guilty on all charges despite his legal team's best efforts. In October of 1986, he was found guilty on all counts and sentenced to 70 years in prison, given a fine of $376,000 
and was required to forfeit half of the proceeds he had gained through racketeering, which was an estimated $30 million. Back to the Mafia Commission trial, Salerno, along with all of the other bosses, would plead not guilty. By November 19th of 1986, Salerno's luck would run out again, and he would be convicted on RICO charges. He would be sentenced in January of 1987, 100 years in prison without parole, and a fine of $240,000. Altogether, that's a sentencing of 170 years behind bars and fines totaling $30,616,000. 1986 was also the time when Salerno's former protege Cafano became an informant and routed out the Genovese family's entire operation. He clued the FBI in to the fact that Salerno was not the real boss, but only a cover for Gigante. There was some hope from the Salerno side that this could potentially lead to a mistrial in the Mafia Commission case, since law enforcement had erroneously given him the title of Genovese boss. However, as someone Rea would later clearly describe in his book Five Families, The Rise, Decline, and Resurgence of America's Most Powerful Mafia Empires, Salerno was never charged with being a Mafia boss. He was charged for crimes he directly committed. So, there was no reason for the courts to reevaluate their decision. Besides, even if they did reevaluate, Salerno still had that 70 years that he'd earned from that other trial to worry about. After Salerno was put away, his health conditions continued to worsen. It's believed that in addition to his diabetes and complications from previous strokes, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. He would suffer a final stroke in federal prison. He would die as a result of the stroke a few days later on July 27, 1992, in the Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri. His body would be returned to his home state of New York, and he would be laid to rest at St. Raymond's Cemetery in the Bronx, New York. He was 80 years old, and had served under seven Cosa Nostra bosses. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews, discussing the life of almost Genovese boss, but certainly Genovese everything else, Tony Salerno. Salerno was one of those mobsters who seemed to be born with the knowledge of how to be a mobster, and he took it really far in his life. Make sure to let me know in the comment section below, or on Facebook and Twitter, what you think about Tony Salerno. Also, don't forget to utilize that comment section in social media to let me know about who or what you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you, and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your soapbox. Ciao.